All right, so let's continue with more kernel stuff, more driver stuff. Uh, please welcome my colleague Paul uh, on DRM KMS driver side APIs. Thank you, guys. Um, so, contradictory to what is on the slide, this is not FOSDEM 2033, but forgive me about that. Um, yeah, I will start with a little bit of introduction about myself. So I'm Paul Kshalkovsky. Um I'm working at Bootlin. We are an engineering service company working mostly on, on Linux and also bootloader and build system aspects. Um, I've been working on graphics and multimedia topics essentially on the DRM and V4L2 frameworks of uh, Linux. I live in the southwest of France. Um, and before I continue with the slides, I will make a little bit of a disclaimer. Uh, so these slides are like a little bit of a reference manual to the DRM KMS internal API. So it's kind of something I would have wanted to have around when I wrote my first DRM driver. Um, so this is kind of intended towards a specific audience, which is people who will actually work on, on DRM. So um, I'm going to spend a little bit of time on general concepts and things like that, but it's mostly going to be a review of the API itself. So lots of uh, function calls, structures, and, and so on. So don't be surprised um, if you find this a little bit boring uh, also. So I kind of apologize in advance, but I'm sure that this will be useful for uh, some people at least. So um, let's begin with that introduction. Uh, and first, let's talk about the general uh, display hardware pipeline, um, just to kind of get clear ideas about that. Um, we have a number of different things that are connected together uh, in this pipeline. So um, this really represents the data flow um, of a typical uh, display chain. So it starts with something we call the frame buffer here, uh, which really represents the pixel data that you have in memory that you want to show on the, on, on the screen. Um, it gets connected to a plane, which is really an association of um, the pixel with some attributes, um, like how should the pixels be rotated, should they be scaled, what's the pixel format that the pixels are represented in, and um, if we have different frame buffers that we can show on the same screen, how they should be mixed together. So should they be stacked one on top of each other, uh, which one goes on top of which, uh, things like that. So that's a notion of plane. Then after that, we have something called the CRTC, uh, which comes from the uh, cathode ray tube controller. It's obviously legacy wording, but we still use that to talk about um, the part of the display controller that generates timings. So display works with specific timings, which means that you have to send the pixels um, in a specific order uh, and at a specific rate. Um, so the CRTC is really the component that will grab the pixels from memory and kind of stream them at the right rate, uh, depending on what was configured. So this notion of uh, creating a kind of like a, a synchronous um, feed, a synchronous FIFO uh, for transmitting the pixel, that's the job of the CRTC. Then after that, we have a component called the encoder. Uh, the encoder is really there to receive those pixels that are correctly timed and to translate that into a particular um, physical encapsulation for a display interface. So for example, if you're using HDMI, the physical encapsulation is called TMDS for transition minimized differential signaling. And so the encoder will just take the pixels and format them with the uh, specific HDMI format and TMDS encoding on the actual physical lines. So this is where you usually plug your cable, uh, but you can also have another component um, between your encoder and your monitor, which is called a bridge. And the bridge is there to do some transcoding. So transcoding means that you go from a specific display interface to another one. So for example, uh, you might have a display controller that has some HDMI output, but you actually really want to use display ports. So in the middle, you can put a bridge that does the HDMI to display port uh, trans translation, basically. So you can have one bridge, but you can actually have many more bridges that are chained. Okay, so it's not necessarily just one. It can be multiple uh, bridges, one after the other. And at the end, you get a final connector where you expect people to like plug a cable or have a, a, a panel connected. So that's the last part, which is the panel or the monitor. Um, the difference I make between the two is that the panel is something that is kind of always connected to your system. Uh, it's like your smartphone, your tablet, your laptop. You have a screen and you're not expected to unplug that screen. It's just always there. Uh, at the contrary, a monitor works more like with a cable and a particular connector. 
<coughs> so you can decide to switch the monitor to use a different one and we're going to see that this has some uh, implications. So that's a general pipeline. The components from plane to encoder are part of what we call the display controller and uh, the interface between, let's say, the encoder or the bridge and the panel or monitor is what we call the connector. So we're going to see that um, these elements are represented in DRM KMS. So in terms of uh, actual hardware that we find, um, there's basically two uh, two different, uh, I would say, groups of hardware. The first one is the typical graphics cards that are usually PCI Express, that probably everyone knows, that's what you get in your big uh, PCs. Uh, it's usually used on x86, even though now you can find that uh, on big, powerful ARM machines or uh, other architectures as well. And in the embedded case, uh, we usually find the display controller in uh, the system on a chip directly. Uh, then we can have those bridges that I mentioned, which can, uh, which can either be components inside a system on a chip, uh, or they can also be discrete components outside of it. Okay, so you can have dedicated bridge chips, and you can also have um, bridge uh, units inside the SOC. They will uh, mostly be represented the same way. We don't make such a big difference between the two. And uh, at the end, we have our display connectors and uh, panels, which are like physical, uh, physical connectors that we have on the uh, boards or the graphics cards. Then I'm also um, giving some precisions about how memory is managed, because that really depends on the hardware that we're using. Uh, there's basically three different cases. Uh, the first one is uh, dedicated memory, which is basically on a graphics card. You have dedicated RAM that will be used just for the graphics things. It's not the same as the RAM that your uh, system is using. So that's the first case. And then you have two different cases um, that use the same memory as the general system. This is what we call shared memory. Uh, and you can have two different types of shared memory. The first one is when your uh, display device has an IOMMU, so it's able to map pages. Okay, so uh, in that case, you can use um, anonymous pages of memory from your system memory, and you can use scattergather to create a virtually contiguous buffer with uh, those pages. Uh, but if you don't have an IOMMU, then your display device cannot do any mapping, and you have to have a contiguous memory area. That's uh, what we call reserved contiguous memory. Um, there's also some concern about cache management uh, because when you are writing the pixels from your CPU into, uh, into the shared memory, into the DRAM, you have to make sure that the pixels are actually pushed to the memory and they don't stay in the cache. And the same if you were to read something from that memory, you would also need to make sure that um, you're not reading data from, well, like old data from your cache. So you have some cache maintenance operations that uh, sometimes need to be done. So we're going to see later how DRM handles this. Um, final uh, introduction slide about the um, Linux and user space uh, support. So um, this talk is about DRM KMS, but there is a, another legacy interface called FBDev. Uh, which has lots of issues and uh, generally quite bad performance. So the plan is to remove it eventually, but uh, unfortunately some people are still using it and there are still cases where it's actually hard to replace. Uh, but please refrain from using this API in the future. Instead use DRM KMS, which is the modern API that has lots of flexibility. You can configure all the different elements that I mentioned from the uh, display pipeline. It has um, lots of different APIs for lots of uh, different useful things. Uh, we'll talk about the memory management using gem and TTM. It can do uh, zero copy DMA buff, which means that you can actually import data from another device without copying it to, um, to another buffer. You can just like reference an existing buffer and take the data in for your display. So this is, for example, very useful for GPU rendering, where you don't want to copy the data from the GPU into the memory of your display uh, engine. Instead, you use zero copy, and then you can just reuse the same buffer. Uh, other features like uh, fences for synchronization uh, and the Atomic UAPI, which is quite important. Uh, I will have a few slides about this. Uh, generally speaking, the Atomic UAPI is there to allow you to group changes that you want to make to the display pipeline and apply them all at the same time instead of doing it sequentially in multiple calls. That might result in intermediate states being shown on the screen, which is not something that we want. 
So nowadays in user space, uh, DRM KMS is used pretty much by everything. Uh, FBA Dev is uh, kind of still supported as a fallback in many components, uh, and also in some, uh, I would say, quick and dirty projects, which might be actually stuff in production. But uh, yeah, it's again a bad idea. So please, please stop doing that. Uh, and yeah, most of the components that we uh, want to use are supporting DRM KMS. Um, so libraries, display servers, tools, lots of things. So now the support is, is really, really good. So no excuse, that's what I mean by that. Um, okay, so let's uh, jump right into the uh, DRM KMS internals uh, on, on the kernel side, okay? So this, is, this talk is not really about the UAPI, it's really more about the kernel uh, API, the internal kernel API. So uh, where do we start? Well, just like any driver in Linux, we have a bus infrastructure that is there to provide us uh, with a uh, device, okay? So this bus infrastructure really depends on the hardware that we are talking about. Uh, if we're talking about big graphics cards, we're probably using the PCI bus, okay? So we write a, a PCI driver. Um, for system and chip units, it's the platform bus that we use, so we get a platform device and so on for a uh, few, few different ones. Uh, special mention for MyPy DSi, which is only a, a, a display-specific type of bus, okay? So on MyPy DSi, you, it's actually integrated as the bus infrastructure in Linux. So you get a MyPy DSi device, which you will use to create your uh, DRM driver. So by DRM driver, we can actually mean a few different things. Um, there is essentially three types of uh, devices that we are going to register from this bus infrastructure. Uh, the main one is the DRM device, uh, which is there for display controllers, and it's the one that will actually expose the UAPI uh, to uh, software in user space. Uh, but we can also have bridge drivers, uh, because the bridge are independent from the uh, DRM device and from the display controller in general. And we can also have DRM panels, which are also separate, uh, separate drivers and separate devices. So the idea is that you're going to be able to connect those uh, things together. And in order to do that, you need to be able to, for, for each component, to uh, be able to contact one another. And so the first thing you need to do is to have some topology that tells you uh, which component is connected to which. So this is done uh, usually on embedded using device tree and what we call the device tree graph. So um, this is a particular syntax in device tree that uses the port and endpoint uh, properties. So we can have an example just, just here. Uh, on the left side, we have a display controller uh, and it has this uh, ports node here. Okay, and so then we have a number of ports that are described. So I'm only showing one here. Uh, so that support, that's the endpoint. And we have this remote endpoint property here, which um, uh, designates another node. So it's another uh, device. In that case, it's a bridge device. Um, and we have in the node for, for, for this other device, we have the re reciprocal uh, remote endpoint, which points back to this one. So it's like a bi-directional link. And this is how we can actually create the topology between these different components. Uh, here we also have a panel, which is actually a sub-node of the DSi controller. That's because, like I mentioned, on DSi, uh, the device, well, the, the DSi device uh, actually creates a bus, so you can have panel devices on that bus, and so this panel is uh, an example of such. So you don't need to use the uh, port and endpoint representation, you can just make it a child, and then the DSi controller knows how to find this one, uh, again, using device tree. Okay, so uh, now let's focus on the display controller um, uh, drivers. Okay, so let's take a look at kind of how uh, we create such a driver, what do we need to do, and what uh, data structures we're going to deal with, and what kind of key functions we're going to need to use uh, to build up our driver. So the, the main uh, data structure that we need to declare to create a display controller driver is the struct DRM driver. So in there, we're going to populate a driver's feature uh, field, which is a bit field of a number of uh, different flags. So for a display controller driver, we want to set uh, the driver mode set flag uh, to indicate that this, um, this device can actually uh, perform a mode set, so it can configure a CRTC and push pixels out, basically. Um, atomic means that, oh, sorry. Atomic, atomic means that it supports the Atomic API, which not all drivers do, but nowadays it's, it's pretty common. 
uh, and it's a good thing because it's a new and advanced API. And there is the driver gem flag, which is there to indicate that we're going to use the gem uh, memory manager that I'm going to talk about a little bit later. We have some file operations that are basically callbacks when user space uh, calls into the uh, device node that is created. Uh, so we have um, defines for that, which make it uh, easier. Uh, uh, then we have a bunch of information, which is not very useful, uh, and other callbacks, which are also related to uh, Gem uh, Memory Manager. So again, I'm going to uh, mention those a little bit later. So again, this is like a st oh, sorry, this is a static declaration that we put like on top of the driver, and then uh, using this static declaration, we are going to get a DRM device, which really identifies. Um, the, the device from the user space perspective. So it's going to create nodes in, in slash dev, uh, one for the card especially. Um, and this is what user space is able to use to make some IOCTLs and to configure the display pipeline. So um, how does it work at Probe? Uh, we create this uh, DRM device using the static DRM driver definition using DRM dev lock. Uh, there is also a DevM um, variant, so then you don't have to care about the cleanup part um, if it's done correctly. Um, there is also something I wanted to mention that not a lot of drivers do, but it's, it's actually a good thing to have. It's the DRM drivers, uh, DRM firmware drivers only check, uh, which will actually look at the kernel command line and look for the no mode set uh, parameter. And if this parameter is set, it will just give up and not register the driver. So no mode set really just means that you don't want to have any driver that will change the display configuration. Uh, I'm not sure why you would want that, but this is something that exists, so you might as well want to honor this parameter. Then at the end, when uh, we have um, allocated our device, we can register it uh, after we register individual components involved in the pipeline. So I'm going to go over these different components. And at the end, we want to call DRM dev register to say, OK, now we are ready to expose this device to user space. And from this point on, we can have calls from user space. So these components that we need to, registers, uh, to register are the ones that I mentioned in the global display pipeline. So we, get, uh, we have our plane, our CRTC, our encoder, and connector. Um, so the general order to register them is first the plane, then CRTC, then encoder, then connector. But we actually have to create links back and forth to make sure that uh, each component uh, is kind of connected to other ones because it's a pipeline. Uh, so the order is actually not super important and you can do it in a slightly different order, but that's just generally how it's done. Uh, for the remove callback of the display controller driver, um, you unregister with this helper. And there is also something in important, which is this DRM atomic helper shutdown, which will um, deconfigure all of the CRTCs and all of the pipelines that are running uh, before you actually shut down the device. So this is just to make sure that the hardware is not active when you decide to uh, unload the device. There are also uh, similar helpers for suspend and resume. So at suspend, it will kind of create a copy of the current state of the pipeline configuration. It will keep it aside, disable everything. And then when you resume um, from sleep, uh, it will, with this helper, restore the state and make sure that everything goes back to what it was when you suspended. So basically, in, in your driver, you don't have to do this manually. You can just call these helpers, and it will do it right uh, for you. So that's pretty nice. OK, now I'm back to memory management in, in more details, because that's something you have to uh, take care of in the um, uh, display controller driver. So in DRM, there's basically two memory managers. Uh, first one is called TTM. Second one is called JAM. Uh, so TTM is kind of like a big and complex uh, beast. OK, it it's, was kind of designed to cover all possible use cases and to be uh, extremely extensive and everything. But in the end, it turned out to be quite uh, difficult to use. Um, but it's the only one that supports uh, dedicated video memory. OK, so if you're writing a driver for a graphics card that has dedicated RAM, then you have to use TTM. Uh, the transition table uh, manager because it will kind of keep track of the state of memory on both sides. Okay. Uh, on the contrary, the second memory manager called Jam, uh, the graphics execution manager, which is used by almost every embedded DRM uh, driver, uh, is much simpler. It's more like a collection of helpers uh, that the drivers can use, but it only supports uh, shared system memory. 
Okay, so you cannot use that for a graphics card driver that has attached memory. Um, so, like I said, to use gem, you have to, you just have to use uh, this define with the uh, uh, file operations and ops. Okay, so you just put those in the definition of your struct GRM driver and it will automatically bind gem into your driver. So you don't have to do more than that. Um, there is a variant with the dumb create operation, which is uh, a callback that you can uh, implement yourself to apply specific hardware constraints when creating the memory for a frame buffer. So typically there might be alignment constraints related to the, uh, the stride and stuff like that. Uh, so this is how you can uh, have your own. But other than that, uh, Gem will manage the memory allocation by itself. Uh, generally, it will allocate DMA buffers with DMA alloc WC, which is write combined. Uh, it's a form of uh, coherent memory. Uh, it will check if there is an IOMMU or not. So if you have an IOMMU, it will, um, it will allocate non-contiguous pages and create a virtual memory mapping. But if you don't have an IOMMU, it will um, actually use uh, what we call um, contiguous memory. So uh, I'm going to talk about that just next. Uh, it also supports non-coherent um, allocations, meaning that you have to do the cache management yourself. Um, there's some functions uh, to help with that. But in the vast majority of cases, people want coherent memory uh, because it's just easier to use and it has uh, just more advantages. There is a helper function that you can use to get the uh, DMA address for a specific frame buffer. So this is what uh, drivers will use to actually configure the physical or virtual memory that uh, the hardware will actually use to read the pixels uh, from the planes. So that's kind of one important helper for that. So let's focus a little bit on the contiguous memory allocation. Uh, in Linux, there is a uh, framework, I guess, called CMA uh, for the contiguous memory allocator. And this one is really there to ensure that we can allocate large area, uh, ar areas of memory that are uh, contiguous in memory. So it means that it's not pages all around the place, uh, but instead it's one big buffer. And for multimedia, if you uh, want to have high dimensions, like even full HD, uh, it will take up a few megabytes. And so having a, uh, an allocation of a few megabytes that always succeeds is uh, quite a challenge, unless you have lots of memory, but in the embedded context, uh, you probably don't have that much. Uh, so this is why this CMA API is actually going to reserve uh, an area of memory that will be dedicated uh, to this purpose. So you can decide of the size. Okay, you have a default pool that is available for every device that needs CMA. And um, you can decide on the side either using a, um, a k-config option or using a command line parameter. So you can say I'm going to dedicate 200 megs to CMA and then your display driver that needs to use CMA for allocation will have 200 megs that are kind of guaranteed uh, to be available. But of course, uh, if other devices use the same pool, uh, they might, might also uh, fill it up. So this is why you can actually have a dedicated pool just for your device. This is something you can declare with uh, device tree. Okay, so you can say, um, I want to create a pool of this, uh, th this much memory that is only available to my graphics uh, display device. So that's an example of how it goes in device tree. Um, you have this reserved memory uh, node declaration with a particular um, node here with the shared DMA pool compatible. And you're going to link to that region using the memory region property of your uh, display engine in, um, in, in device tree. All right, so that's pretty much it for memory. Uh, now we're going to move on to the next step, which is the mode config. It's like a, a general top level uh, DRM object that is uh, there to uh, ease the, the frame buffer allocation. So um, we have to configure this mode config with a few parameters, essentially the maximum dimensions for the uh, frame buffer, some fallback um, preferred depth, and we have some callback functions, which are mostly boilerplate, meaning that as soon as you are using gem, you can just fill the fields of, of these functions to existing functions provided by DRM. So there is one to create a frame buffer. Okay, so this will be called when user space requests a frame buffer to be created. 
Uh, there is one to validate the general um, uh, atomic commits that user space uh, creates when using the atomic API. Uh, and there is one to actually apply uh, the atomic commit. And this is actually the entry point that will trigger the whole atomic mechanism and go on to call um, similar functions on the different components. So uh, the mode config is one of the first things that you need to configure before uh, registering your device. So you can call uh, drmm mode config init. Uh, the, the extra m means drm managed. And this one will automatically call back the cleanup uh, counterpart. Okay, so you don't have to care about it explicitly. Uh, and this will, this will call the destroy functions of the different components uh, when, you, when you are done using the DRM device. There is also a helper for reset, which will call similarly all the reset functions for all the components that you register subsequently. Okay, um, now a little bit of more details about um, Atomic and Atomic support. So like I said, Atomic is an API that allows user space to group a number of changes uh, to the display pipeline together and to apply them at exactly the same time. Um, so in order to do that, user space just provides a list of property changes, but the framework is actually going to uh, derive that into a new state. So the state is like the collection of all the different properties about all the different components that we need to keep track of and that we need to use to configure the hardware. Um, and um, basically the framework is going to create, whenever there is a commit, the framework is going to create a new state, but you also get access to the previous state, to the old state. Uh, and you have a different structure uh, of the atomic state for each component. So you have like the plain state, you have the CRTC state, uh, and so on. Um, before that, before atomic, there was uh, um, the non-atomic API, which is also, which uh, has dedicated callbacks in the drivers, but now they shouldn't be used anymore because atomic is really the way to go. Uh, so I'm only going to mention the atomic callbacks here. So let's start with the planes. Um, we have to explicitly create planes before we register our device. It's one of the components that we need to, carry, to, to care about. Uh, so planes have types. You have primary, overlay, and cursor. So the names are kind of uh, obvious, at least for cursor. Uh, primary is generally a plane that covers the whole active space uh, of the screen. And overlay is kind of a plane that can be smaller and, and put like, um, above or under the primary one. But uh, in practice, there is usually no big difference between primary and overlay. You just need to assign one as primary, but yeah, it's not super relevant. You can do everything with just overlay and yeah, you know. So uh, you have to indicate which uh, CRTC can be connected to the plane. Okay, so uh, sometimes a plane can be connected to multiple CRTCs. So this is actually a bit mask uh, of the CRTC index. And for each plane, you indicate which pixel formats are supported and uh, which modifiers are supported. So the modifiers are basically a way to say that the order in which the pixels are stored is uh, not the usual uh, linear or raster order, but it's something uh, different. Then we have uh, functions as well, which are uh, again callbacks that are just filled with boilerplate stuff. So you can just use these functions. Uh, there is the reset and destroy, which I mentioned are called by the DRM, M, the DRM uh, mode config cleanup and reset. Uh, so yeah, and then you have um, helpers to manage the atomic state. So duplicate and destroy the states and uh, finally, update and disable the plane, which is the one that uh, will start the mechanism for updating the, uh, the, st the, the hardware configuration of the plane, but it's not actually this callback that does it. Uh, this is really just a callback to the general logic here, so that's why it's boilerplate. And the actual callbacks are in the helper functions. Uh, the helper functions get the DRM atomic state, Okay, so in those functions, you can inspect the atomic state and check um, uh, what changed, what, uh, how do I need to configure the hardware, essentially. So the state has the currently attached CRTC for the plane and the frame buffer that we want to uh, show on that plane, as well as a number of properties. Okay, uh, and in the helper functions, we actually have the check, update, and disable callbacks, which is where the driver implementer is actually going to configure the hardware using the state, uh, using the new state, but it can also compare with the old state, which is also available. 
Um, at probe, you register your planes with DRM universal plane init, and uh, you register those uh, helper functions with a specific call, and then you can configure uh, specific plane properties. So there are some generic plane properties which are already registered by the framework, and this is what uh, user space is going to use to configure the plane. So for example, it will say uh, the dimensions of the plane, the position of the screen, the rotation, things like that. But you can create more. You can indicate the plane-wide alpha property, the stacking order, so yeah, the rotation, blend mode, and scaling filter, in case the plane is scaled. Uh, but you can also add uh, custom properties, and there is actually more than that which are available. So this is really a, a flexible way to configure things. And again, the uh, properties, uh, the, the values of these properties will be available in the atomic state, so you can then uh, grab those configuration elements and apply them to the hardware in those uh, DRM helper functions. Uh, in the display, uh, in the in the yeah, in the display control driver, we're going to deal with a number of uh, structures for metadata. The first one is the mode, which really has the timings that we want to configure on the CRTC, and it also has a number of elements characterizing the signal. For example, the polarity of the signal, which sampling edge should be used, things like that. So we have the mode uh, just for the timings and the display info, which kind of extends the timings with uh, some flags for the signal characteristics and also for the bus format which is actually used on the display interface. Um, the mode and actually the display info are retrieved either statically, uh, they can be hard-coded by specific drivers, uh, or they can be dynamically uh, read from the EDID, which is something that uh, monitors have in an EPROM uh, on, on the monitor itself. So the display controller will go and read this EDID and then derive these two informations, which can then be used uh, in the atomic state to configure things. Okay, so we have... Um, um, yeah, the connector data, uh, so that's the, the, the connector part after the, the plane. Um, we have, yeah, again, number of things. So there's a type of connector for the display interface indication. There's a status to know if the connector is connected or not. Uh, and the uh, list of modes that were retrieved for this connector. So the mode is really tied to the connector. Uh, the list of modes is tied to the connector, and then a single mode will be applied to a CRTC. We also have our functions, which are mostly boilerplate, so I'm going to skip that. Um, and what's important is really the atomic state, which has the associated CRTC and encoder uh, for this uh, connector, and uh, also properties, because connectors also have properties. Um, in those helper functions, which is where we actually do things, we have a callback to get mode, which can use uh, EDID or callback into a panel to get the modes from the panel. Uh, also something to uh, validate and fix up the modes that are retrieved, and uh, a callback to detect the status of the connector, which will be called by the framework uh, on various occasions. Uh, so the probe sequence is really boilerplate, so I'm going to skip that, um, and skip to hot plug. So generally a connector can be hot plugged, right, because you want to uh, you know, plug your HDMI cable and plug it, etc. Uh, so there's usually a line for detecting that um, that will change state. So you can, it can be as easy as just having a GPIO to read the state of that line and to know if there's something connected or not. Sometimes it can be a register that you read on the hardware. It, it kind of depends. Uh, but what's important is that sometimes you have an, an interrupt associated with that and sometimes not. Uh, so when you do have an interrupt, it's easy. You have a, a, an interrupt uh, callback uh, and you just have to report that there was a, a hot plug detect IRQ event. And then the framework will call back to the uh, detect function to know the new, the new uh, connection state. Um, but if you don't have an IRQ, you can also use active polling with uh, helpers that will uh, look, call the detect uh, function ten, 10 times a second, and it will check if the state has changed. So even if you don't have an IRQ, uh, DRM makes it easy for you to uh, still support hot plugging. So that's it for connectors. Uh, now moving on to the CRTC configuration, which is really where most of the work happens. Um, the CRTC structure itself doesn't have much information, uh, mostly some legacy stuff for compatibility. And really, we are going to uh, get the configuration of the CRTC from the atomic state. Um, we also have these CRTC functions, which are uh, essentially boilerplate. 
The only two important parts to implement for display driver are enable vBlank and disable vBlank, which is about enabling and disabling the vBlank interrupt, which signals the start of a frame. So whenever a new frame is being transmitted to the display, you get a vBlank interrupt, and this will be used to perform what we call page flipping, which is about switching the frame buffer exactly at a time that it is not being sent, uh, so that you avoid a problem called tearing. Uh, if you do that switch in the middle of transmission, then you will get half of the old frame and half of the new frame. So we need that vBlank interrupt to be able to synchronize to the beginning of a new frame uh, to switch our uh, buffers. So this is the responsibility of the CRTC to enable or disable this uh, vBlank interrupt. Um, like I said, we are going to use the atomic state to configure our CRTC, and it has all of the things that uh, we need to know about, essentially the mode. So there is the adjusted mode, which was, uh, let's say, tweaked by the different components, and uh, the uh, mode, uh, just mode, which is the one that was uh, requested by user space. So user space will get the list of modes from the uh, DRM connector, and it will choose one, uh, one of the modes, and push it to the uh, CRTC. So that's what we get as the mode. And then we have these, uh, sorry, these uh, mode valid and fix up callbacks, which will be there to evict some modes that cannot be supported by this display controller. Uh, and potentially with fix up, it might change the timings a little bit. So that's what we get with adjusted mode. And this is the one that should be used to actually configure the timings to the hardware. So we use the fields of this structure to configure the hardware registers, and this is how the CRTC is going to apply the correct timing to the display flow. Um, it also deals with, uh, again, the, the vBlank event. Uh, I think I'm mentioning it just next. Um, and uh, very important are the helper functions again. So I mentioned the mode valid and fix up, and there's also ones to check the atomic state. Okay, so for example, uh, yeah, it will be there to say if the, the, the what user space wants is uh, uh, um, uh, correct or not, and it will um, uh, enable vBlank when you s enable the CRTC, which is where the configuration happens, and disable with vBlank off. Um, okay, so I'm going to skip the uh, vBlank reporting. So this is just the process to register your CRTC. You can see it uh, involves the planes as well. So you have to kind of indicate which plane is primary and which is overlay. All right. Um, next up is the encoder. So the encoder is very simple. It doesn't actually have uh, a state. So you, you just have to uh, set the cleanup callback for the functions. Um, to to um, uh, properly destroy this encoder uh, at the end. So the helper functions are quite simple, atomic enable and disable to just enable and disable the encoder. Usually you don't need to configure anything and if you need to do that, you can just use the CRTC state, which is also available from these callbacks. Um, and uh, that will be it. So encoder is usually uh, quite simple. Of course, you need to attach your encoder to a connector uh, and also to a CRTC. All right, um, that's it for the display uh, controller uh, setup, basically. So um, you do the uh, mode config, connector, encoder, CRTC, and uh, from that, you have support for your display controller. Uh, I also mentioned the bridge and panels as uh, extra components that can be supported. So with the bridge, it works a little bit the same. You also have a notion of atomic state. You have a number of fields that should be uh, configured, but it's a separate driver. So a bridge is a separate driver from the display controller driver. Um, we, we have some functions. Uh, some are boilerplate, and uh, some are actually where we configure things. Uh, essentially this one. So attach and detach is how we are going to connect a bridge to a specific encoder. We also have the mode validation and fix up. And there is a whole thing about negotiation for the input and output bus formats for this bridge, which is mostly useful to chain multiple bridge bridges together. So and actually in most drivers, these are not really implemented. Um, all right, so like I said, it has a bridge state, um, which has some information about the, the bus format, but again, that's mostly useful for chaining the bridges. Okay, um, yeah, so this is how you uh, 
configure and register your bridge from the bridge driver and then from the display controller you call this DRM OF find panel uh, or bridge function which will give you a handle to the bridge that is connected using the device tree uh, graph and endpoint uh, topology uh, like I mentioned earlier. Um, for the bridge, uh, the, the bridge driver will create the connector itself so you don't need to do that on the display controller driver. Uh, and, like I said, you can chain multiple bridges, so in that case, it's the final bridge that will register the DRM connector and not um, um, the, the first one because the connector is really at the edge of the bridge chain. For the panels, uh, very briefly, the interface is also quite simple. There's no uh, atomic states, um, so you just have those callbacks to um, um, set up the panel. Uh, it's always attached to a this is off, yeah, to a backlight device, okay, so backlight and panel are attached and this is done, um, let's say, at the API level, so in your panel driver, you don't need to explicitly enable and disable backlight, you just need to attach a backlight device to your panel and the KMS framework will automatically enable and disable it at the right time. Uh, okay, so the integration for that also uses the DRM uh, OF fine panel bridge uh, call uh, from the side of the display controller and this is how it will get a handle to the panel and then it can uh, use various functions to enable, disable, prepare and prepare and get the modes from the panel. Um, there is now a new abstraction in DRM called DRM Panel Bridge uh, and the general idea is that instead of having two different APIs for the panel and for the bridge, we are going to represent everything as a bridge. So this is kind of an abstraction that will wrap the panel API under the bridge API and then for uh, display controller drivers, you can just use uh, DevM DRM OF get bridge instead of this one and then you just get a bridge regardless of whether it's a con uh, um, an actual bridge or a panel. So this this is a lot easier, uh, it will also manage the connector, so uh, that means a lot less work to do for your display control drivers, so this is really the new API that everyone should use to deal with panel and bridges uh, the same way. Uh, this slide is just kind of a list of generic uh, drivers that you can use for panel uh, and bridges. Uh, mostly uh, panel simple is the one that is used by uh, almost anyone who needs to support a panel that doesn't require a particular uh, uh, register configuration. So uh, it's just a static um, uh, list of uh, modes, okay, because the panel will provide the modes to the connector. Um, yeah, just one thing I wanted to mention about specific drivers. So if you're writing a panel driver, uh, please be careful about how you name it because there is often a confusion between the name of the panel and the name of the LCD controller that is driving the panel. So a LCD controller can be used with multiple panels in multiple different configurations. So um, please do not create a device tree compatible for a specific LCD controller because it doesn't it identify a specific panel. It just identifies the chips that can be used in lots of different ways. So it's perfectly fine to have a common driver for the same LCD controller, but it needs to have specific compatibles for each panel that is using this LCD controller. So this is uh, quite, quite important because this confusion exists in the tree as of today and after the compatible is pushed, it's too late, so please be careful about that and don't make this confusion. This is an example of how you can support one in panel simple, so this is the static mode, this is the panel description which has a few more things like the uh, uh, media bus format and the compatible that links everything together. So with just these three entries, you can support a panel with static modes, so that's pretty nice. Um, yeah, that's the final slide about uh, repository, uh, different repositories for DRM. So depending on which area you're working on, uh, you have to submit patches for one of these trees. Mostly for embedded, we're using the uh, DRM MISC uh, subsystem. Okay, so this is where you should uh, send patches to. That's it for me. I know this was uh, quite a bit of a rush and lots of information at the same time. Uh, hopefully, if you're interested in these topics, you will go back and read the slides slowly uh, and, and hopefully uh, that, that will be useful. So thanks everybody and if you have questions, I'll be happy to answer them. <laughs>